Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Is It Time to Boot the B-61 Nuclear Bomb? We're so pleased that you could join Juan for this presentation, and we're very excited to hear from Hans Christensen of the Federation of American Scientists and David Culp of the Friends Committee on National Legislation. My name is Azi Vokiwa. I am a senior Juan Will Program Associate, and I will be running the technology during the webinar today. Uh, before we get started with Hans and David's presentation, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items. Um, all the attendees will be muted during the presentation, uh, but we know you'll have questions, so please submit them using the question panel of your um, attendee panel. There should be a box that says questions, and when you type them there, uh, I'll be able to see them, and after Hans and David finish their presentation, I'll ask the questions to them out loud. If you have any technical difficulties, uh, please contact GoToWebinar directly. Their phone number is 1-800-263-6317. And now I'm going to turn it over to Kathy Robinson, our Senior policy, Public Policy Director, and she's going to introduce Hans and David. Kathy? Uh, thank you, Adzi. So um, just first, a quick word about who is Women's Action for New Directions and why we're doing these webinars on nuclear budget issues. Um, WAND started as Women's Action for Nuclear Disarmament in, in the 1980s, so for 30 years we've been um, working on issues related to this. We changed our name um, in the 90s when we thought, oh, the Cold War was ending and that there was going to be a peace dividend. and that we would soon be moving to a totally different kind of budget. But what we've seen, of course, is that we're still spending lots of money on uh, Pentagon spending and particularly on Cold War era nuclear weapons. And we are very pleased to have uh, experts talk to us about one of these weapons, which is our oldest weapon in the stockpile, um, and the, the plans to uh, do the B61 uh, life extension program. And we have Hans Christensen from the Federation of American Scientists, and he is the director of the Nuclear Information Project, and really an expert at ferreting out information about the U.S. nuclear force and uh, the role of nuclear weapons. And um, we're, so we're really pleased to have him talk to us about the B61 and its status. And then we have uh, David Culp, who's a lobbyist with the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And David has been uh, working in the field of nuclear disarmament uh, work on uh, Capitol Hill and with grassroots advocates for a couple of decades at least. And so he's going to tell us what are some of the things that we can do and we hope that Congress can do um, to help us control costs of the nuclear budget with the B61. So with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Hans to, to begin the presentation. Great. Thanks very much. And uh, thank you for the uh, invitation um, to speak with you today. Um, I'm going to flip through my slides here. I have about 15 or so of them, um, and I'll try not to dwell too much on it. I know I have only about 20 minutes to say what I want to say, and then we can take questions after that. Um, so um, in here, I have collected a few uh, bits of information relating to the program itself, what they plan to do, costs, the mission, um, implications of it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it speaks for itself. Um, and I hear there's a slight delay between changing um, the slides, so I should uh, take somewhat of a break um, in between. Um, let me see here. I hope uh, this is clear for everyone. Um, first of all, the concept here uh, of the B-61-12, a new version of the B-61 bomb, uh, like it was mentioned before, a weapon that has been in its uh, various uh, uh, versions in the U.S. Uh, nuclear arsenal for many, many decades. Uh, 
but now we're getting to a point where they're uh, planning to upgrade uh, a weapon that and, and give it new capabilities um, uh, and it's very expensive and so this raises a, a, a wide range of issues. Here you can see a cut um, from uh, sort of a modified version of a, 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 a little drawing that US Strategic Command put together in which they show four weapons on one side that are being consolidated into one and uh, I have changed a little here to more accurately portray what, what is going on, um, where it's essentially um, one of the weapons, the B-61-4, that has been life extended, uh, its life, its nuclear warhead package. And then you have selected components from uh, three other versions that are being added to it. Then you have a new thing, which is a new guided tail kit that I will describe a little more in detail later that's being added and you get uh, uh, some new uh, safety and security features, uh, surety features as they call it, the one word. So the official arguments are of course that um, all of this um, is going to um, reduce the number of weapons that are in the stockpile and save money, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, let's see here, there you go. Uh, so the claims on the left side are a bunch of uh, arguments in favor, of course. Um, first of all, that it's not a new nuclear bomb, that's simply a life extension of an existing version. Uh, another argument is that there are no new military capabilities being added uh, through this program. Um, that it will result in uh, important cost savings and that it will result in a reduction of the stockpile. Um, also that this upgrade is needed to give them the ability to improve uh, the nuclear surety I talked about before of the weapon, uh, and also that a full life extension program is urgently needed. We can't wait. We have to get going right away. Um, the counter arguments uh, that I will use here are that <clears throat> it is, in fact, a new uh, nuclear bomb type because it's not currently in the nuclear stockpile. They may take a warhead that is in the current stockpile, but the weapon is more than the warhead. Um, and this new version that's coming out, uh, again, is not in the current stockpile. So it is a new bomb type. Um, and it has improved military capabilities. It's not just um, the existing version that's being carried forward. Um, I'll tell that, uh, more about that in, uh, later. Uh, also, it is very, very expensive. It's uh, probably the most expensive nuclear bomb project ever uh, because it is uh, so extensive. Um, they want to do so much, um, and uh, there are so many different components they plan to work on and improve and reproduce, et cetera, et cetera, that this just adds up to one, uh, well, probably the most expensive bomb project ever. Um, and uh, the argument that it will reduce the stockpile, yes, that is true. Uh, it will probably re enable them to reduce uh, the number of weapons, B-61 type weapons that are in the stockpile. Some. But of course, the stockpile has been reduced anyway, uh, has been for many years, and will continue to do so. So it's not like reductions of the stockpile are depending on this particular program. Um, uh, and the argument that they need to um, enhance the safety and security of this weapon is odd because the B-61 bomb is already one of the most, if not the most, safe and secure weapon in the U.S. stockpile, specifically because a great number of them were deployed overseas in other countries during the Cold War. Um, a few of them uh, still are. Um, but that means that these types of weapons were generally the ones that were uh, added most safety and security features. Um, so this is somewhat of a vague argument or a mute argument. Um, another argument, uh, the bottom one, is that a simpler life extension can fix urgent aging issues that are with the warheads and make sure that some form of warhead will continue to function uh, for the foreseeable future to the extent it needs to. Um, improved military capabilities, that is a very important issue because the key here is that the Obama administration has promised and the nuclear posture review that was passed by the uh, or adopted by the administration in 2010 uh, very clearly says that during our life extension programs we will not add new military capabilities to uh, the weapons. That is happening anyway in this case. 
And the reason is not because of the warhead itself. Down at the bottom of the graph to the left, you can see the different versions of B61s. Uh, the B6112 that's at the bottom, that is the life extended version of the B6114. Its maximum yield, explosive yield, is about 50 kiloton. Now, that is much less than the most powerful B61 version. You can see that's the B61-7 that goes all the way up to 360 kiloton. So what the military wants to do is that they say, we need one type of weapon that can cover all the missions that we have for the B61 types today. Therefore, we need to enable this weapon with the smaller yield to be able to do what the big one can do so to speak, hold the certain targets at risk that cannot today be held at risk with the lower yield weapon. The way they're going to do that is add a tail kit to the bomb, a guided tail kit, so they can steer the bomb toward its target. This is going to uh, improve uh, the, the blast point, the point in where the, the explosion happens, how close it happens to the target itself. By doing that, you can, you can have the same, they call it, kill capability <laughs> of the 50 kiloton weapon that you today require a 360 kiloton uh, weapon to do. Uh, now, in the total U.S. stockpile, that doesn't, of course, increase the kill capability of that weapon because we already have the 360. But if you look at Europe, it's a very different situation. Uh, we don't have the 360 kiloton weapon in Europe and never have deployed it there in the past. So by adding this tail kit to the, to the weapon and then returning them to Europe, we're significantly increasing the military capabilities of the weapons that are over there. So. Um, there was an interesting c uh, confirmation of this um, uh, just recently by one of the DOD officials. It is the medium bullet point where you can see there is a quote in there that this new tail kit will, quote, provide a modest standoff capability. That means essentially that it will glide toward the target so that the aircraft can escape um, and sufficient delivery accuracy so that the lower yield of the B-6112 can achieve the same military effect as the original B-61. Um, so this opens up a whole can of worms because now not only can you cover the same target categories, but you can actually begin to do more with less yield. You can, as a military planner, you can begin to select yield uh, options for your attack missions where you get less radioactive fallout from the strike because you can place the warhead closer to the target. Uh, this point of creating less fallout from a nuclear strike is sort of a slippery slope or a, a somewhat of a worrisome development because it opens up uh, this prospect of creating more usable weapons that are less controversial because they have less radioactive fallout that's going to fall over allies and others. So this weapon is going to be integrated on a lot of different aircraft. Um, of course, current B-6217s are integrated, uh, integrated on most of these aircraft today, but this one type will be integrated on all of them, whether they are long-range strategic bombers or shorter-range fighter bombers. You're going to have one type of weapon, so to speak, that will uh, be both on strategic and non-strategic platform. That's really going to complicate uh, arms control efforts in the future because, you know, how do you figure out what portion of the stockpile you're going to apply to the, to, the B, to the strategic bombers and which one to the uh, shorter range bombers. Um, and here you can see the different uh, aircraft uh, that will get the weapon. Um, uh, all of these are in operation today except the one in the top right, which is the new Joint Strike Fighter, the F-35A Lightning. That aircraft is a stealth fighter uh, bomber, which in and of itself will add even more to the capability because we don't currently have stealthy fight, uh, fighter bombers to deliver nuclear weapons. So you add the tail kit that you can see I have drawn up in the, in the center photo there, you add that increased accuracy to the stealthy capability of the Joint Strike Fighter and you have a significant enhanced nuclear capability. 
Um, eventually, it will replace uh, the F-35 will replace uh, the tornado, the one at the bottom, um, and also the F-16 in the nuclear mission. Um, there will be a longer range bomber that will come in uh, probably at the middle or late at the uh, late 1920s and that will also get the B61 as well. This is a very very expensive project as I mentioned earlier. Um, the cost estimate for this that the National Nuclear Security Administration has put forward doubled between 2010 and 2012 from um, 4 billion to 8 billion dollars. Um, the Department of Defense did a study in 2012 that added even more and they're now up to about 10.4 billion dollars. Um, in addition to that, the, the cost of developing the tail kit that gives the weapon its increased accuracy is estimated at at least 1.4 billion dollars. And You can see how the cost estimates for the next uh, several years are, are climbing uh, at the graph at the bottom. Um, this involves plans for only about, well only, but compared to the stockpile of about 5,700 nuclear weapons, uh, 4,700 nuclear weapons, 400 B-6112 bombs makes this the most expensive bomb project uh, ever. Uh, each bomb actually will cost more than its own weight in solid gold. <laughs> this is a very expensive project. Um, you have to add to that, of course, also the cost of integrating the B-6112 on the bombers and the fighter bombers that will cost them more money as well. Now there is a less costly alternative. Here is a uh, reworked uh, version of that um, drawing you first saw up front in the briefing. Uh, but in this one I've changed it so uh, instead of uh, combining these four types into one, you retire three of them and just life extend one of them. And the one you could life extend is this B-61-7, this current strategic version. Um, there are several advantages of doing that. First of all, um, instead of overhauling all the different components in the weapon, you would only focus the life extension of those three components that are the most uh, urgent. And you would deal with them now and then we'll fix others later. Uh, this would save a lot of money. Uh, the cost of that, uh, they call it uh, triple alt life extension, would be only about 1.5 to 2 billion dollars versus the 10.4 billion dollars that's currently planned. The other advantage is that 700 million dollars were already spent on a small life extension on that B-6217 just a few years ago. Those hundreds of millions of dollars will essentially be thrown out um, if they go forward with the plan they have right now. Um, the other advantage is that the B-6217 also has low yield options. So this is not just a, a, a you know, a question of retaining the most, the biggest weapon in, 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 in of the B-61s. You still have low yield options, so the military will be happy. Um, it is already integrated on the B-2, the strike, uh, the, the stealthy um, uh, long range bomber. Uh, you don't have to spend money on doing that, and. Most importantly, I think also it avoids undercutting the PROC speech pledge uh, by President Obama in 2009 and the Nuclear Posture Review that we will not improve military capabilities during the life extension programs. Um, and finally, of course, it enables the withdrawal of the remaining nuclear weapons from Europe because by not life extension the versions they plan to deploy over there, it enables the country to move forward and finish the long and drawn out withdrawal of the nuclear weapons from Europe, the Cold War posture that's no longer needed. Where are these things? Well, um, they're all over the world, so to speak. Um, there are both in the United States and in Europe of the B-61s. Um, you can see the red dots in Europe are the, one, the bases where there currently are both uh, fighter bombers and B-61 bombs present. The blue squares are the ones where there are no bombs presence, present, but they have these underground vaults that are in what they call caretaker status. Status. There used to be weapons there, and they could be returned if necessary. I mean, obviously, they're not going to go back. Eventually, these caretaker vaults will be dismantled, but they're still there. Um, there's also uh, the Lake and Heath Air Base in England, which has um, nuclear capable F-15s, but there are no longer any weapons at the base. Um, and back in the United States, you have 
three strategic bomber bases, Minot, Whiteman, and Barksdale. Uh, only two of them have nuclear weapons present uh, today. That is Whiteman for the B-2 bombers and Minot for the B-52 bombers. Then you also have storage bases, one at Nellis Air Force Base and Kirtland Air Force Base where you store excess weapons that are in long-term storage. Um, that's the status of it uh, currently. Now the numbers, they have changed a lot. Um, the, the table uh, to the bottom left shows uh, my estimate of how many B-61 nuclear bombs total of all types that are in the U.S. stockpile today. Um, you can see there are two categories, one called active stockpile and one inactive stockpile. The active are the weapons that have all their limited life components in, in, in them uh, installed, uh, components such as uh, tritium capsules that otherwise expire after a few years. Those are sort of active weapons. The inactive weapons are those uh, that are missing some of those limited life components. They would have to be uh, uh, you know, replenished and brought up to full operational status before they could actually be used. You can see these kind of split down. And, and, and the second to the last um, row, you can see the big B-6112. Of course, it's not here yet. It will come later. But I put it in so you can see the number and how that compares to how many others there are in the stockpile. And of the active weapons, there are almost 200 of them that are in Europe. Um, I put um, uh, a couple of markers off the uh, B-6213 and B-6214. Uh, those are the types that are still deployed over in Europe. And you can see about the deployment in Europe on the graph to the top right. It has changed significantly since the Cold War. Of course, that's expected, but even after the Cold War ended, the reduction has been significant. And uh, the Bush administration actually uh, cut unilaterally the stockpile by more than half uh, in Europe without demanding anything from the Russians. Um, this deployment in Europe is no longer needed, but it's continued by what I term cold warriors and outdated fear of Russia. Uh, but those are weapons that probably we will, will be withdrawn within the next decade uh, anyway. And so it raises the question, why do this modification in any way and spend $10 billion on a weapon system that's no longer needed in Europe? There's another element of this, which is B61 sharing. Uh, this is a very controversial issue because it it is a um, down in the bottom left box. You can see a quote from the Nuclear Posture Review. There is a unique sharing arrangement under which non-nuclear members of the NATO alliance participate in what they call nuclear planning and quote possess specially configured aircraft capable of delivering nuclear weapons. That means that these countries in a nuclear war would deliver American nuclear bombs on targets. This is uh, a very controversial arrangement because it clearly undercuts the principle of the non-proliferation treaty that nuclear weapon states are not allowed in any shape or form uh, to hand nuclear weapons over to other countries. And it doesn't matter if it's in a war or not. <laughs> Uh, but the interpretation has been that because this arrangement was in place before the Non-Proliferation Treaty entered into effect, therefore is it, it was accepted. And if you're a lawyer, well, then you believe in that. But politically, this is not sustainable. Uh, legal arguments aside, the nuclear sharing arrangement um, in NATO uh, undercuts the non-proliferation norm that NATO and the United States are trying to promote elsewhere in the world. So this is a, a clearly an arrangement that I think should be phased out. So now we're getting to the end here. Um, in, in conclusion, the B61 uh, life extension program is expensive and in excess of national and international security needs in my view. The B61-12 has improved military capabilities that undermine and contradict the, pre the pledge given in Prague and in the Nuclear Posture Review not to add military capabilities. Um, a simpler and cheaper life extension of the B-61-7 would more than adequately meet the security needs. Um, and also the improved capabilities of the B-61-12 bomb and the Joint Strike Fighter, the combination of these two systems together, uh, clearly is a significant enhancement of the nuclear capability in Europe. And, and that undercuts the pledge to reduce nuclear weapons and the 
you know, and also the efforts to make Russia reduce its non-strategic nuclear weapons. So I think it's very, very counterproductive. Um, and finally, cancellation of the B61-12 life extension program um, would facilitate the withdrawal of the remaining nuclear weapons from Europe. Like I said, a posture that was deployed there during the Cold War, a time that is no more, so it's time to move on. And with that, I have, hope I have triggered some questions for all. Thanks. Hi, this is David Culp. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to Juan for organizing this webinar. Really appreciate it. And thanks to Hans for all the background information. I'm going to talk very briefly about Congress and what you can do. As Kathy said at the top end, I'm a lobbyist with the Friends Committee on National Legislation in Washington, which is a Quaker lobby. And I'm sorry to pop your balloon for some of you on the call, but uh, this picture that you see of uh, the Capitol building, and maybe that was in your civics book, what's going on in Congress these days doesn't follow what uh, you learned in high school civics. Uh, we have a fairly dysfunctional Congress. Um, they don't follow the normal order. But having said that, I want to say that they are making decisions. It's definitely possible for uh, the average citizen to have an impact. And I'm cautiously optimistic that over the next two years, we are going to succeed in defeating the refurbishment of this nuclear weapon. So first, I want to talk a little bit about Congress. Um, this is part of the large um, military budget. Specifically, the bomb part is in the Energy Department budget. The tail kit that Hans talked about is in the Pentagon budget. Um, those go through two big committees in both the House and Senate. Uh, first is called the Armed Services Committee, and the second one is the Appropriations Committee. And uh, probably this year, the most important out of these committees is a subcommittee of the Appropriations Committee. It's called the Energy and Water Appropriations Subcommittee. Uh, the bill that they write up every year is probably the weirdest bill that Congress deals with. You've got fish ladders and nuclear bombs uh, in there beside each other. Everything dealing with energy, windmills, uh, water projects, but also nuclear weapons. Um, the chair of that subcommittee is Mr. Friedlingheisen, a moderate Republican from New Jersey. The chair of the, center, uh, the Senate uh, counterpart is Senator Dianne Feinstein of California. Senator Feinstein is definitely uh, very skeptical about this program. A number of us have met with her and talked to her several times. Uh, and I think also Mr. Uh, Freelingheisen is potentially um, opposed to this, primarily because of um, cost reasons. So what's the timing? Uh, the committees have already started uh, writing their bills at the subcommittee level. There'll be more uh, legislative activity in committee this month. Uh, Senate is off to a late start, and they're not going to get going until July. But these uh, negotiations over these budget issues are going to stretch out until um, this fall. and. It, very likely that some of these issues are not going to get resolved. Some of the budget issues won't get resolved until um, December of this year. That's the normal practice these days as uh, Congress waits to the last minute to put together the budget. The thing that is the biggest factor in our favor is the huge cost. Uh, as Hans pointed out, we're um, about $12 billion for this refurbishment. Even in Washington, $12 billion is a lot of money. And you already know uh, the budget pressures here in Washington are just intense. And people are looking for things to cut. They don't have any choice um, because the budget, alloc budget caps are uh, very low these, uh, this year. Now, what can you do? Repeatedly, what our friends in Congress, the congressional staff and members tell us, uh, number one is writing the old-fashioned letter to your member of Congress, except the letter 
today is probably an email. The email is much more effective. It just gets there quicker. It doesn't have to go through all the stupid uh, screening mechanism. So one paragraph uh, letter, which is really a one paragraph email uh, in your own words, not a manufactured uh, or not a template that you've simply borrowed from somebody else and clicked a mouse, but you're in one paragraph that you are opposed to the B61 refurbishment and just give one or two reasons. And don't think that you have to write a three-page letter with all the background. That's not true. The staff have more than enough background. What they want to know is what uh, constituents' position is. The second thing that you uh, can do to help us is get uh, letters to the editor published in your local newspaper. That has a huge impact on members of Congress. And it's very important that you actually mention your member of Congress by name if you simply send a letter to the editor about save the porpoises, but don't mention the member's name, uh, it's never going to end up on their desk. But if you say that Senator John Doe uh, can help save the porpoises, that letter then ends up um, going up the food chain and ends up on his desk because it's got his name in there. And letters to the editor really do have an impact uh, with members of Congress. So those are the two most important things. Is uh, writing a short email to the member. Um, second is writing a little longer uh, letter to the editor and getting it published. The third thing for those of you that are more energetic really is uh, finding other like-minded people in your community. FCNL is about to finish uh, a letter signed that will be signed by about 15 uh, national religious denominations and will give this to WAND and it'll also be up on our website. We're just a couple days away from finishing this. Every one of these denominations, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Unitarians, a number of Catholic groups, so on, you can go to the local uh, Methodist minister, the Presbyterian uh, minister, the um, Catholic priest with this letter and just say, well, here is where your national office is on this uh, new nuclear bomb. Would you be willing to help us? Would you be willing to go with us um, to have a meeting with the congressman? Would you be willing to uh, co-sign a letter to the editor? You can find organizations in your town that um, also oppose uh, this nuclear bomb. And the more organizations, the more people that you get involved, uh, obviously the more impact you're going to have. And so you need to think about uh, reaching out to other people. And I wouldn't be afraid of reaching out to what I would call unlikely allies. Uh, some of the veterans groups, uh, if you talk to them, are going to be on our side. Not that this is at the top of their list. It's not. It's just the, the military budget is so tight. Um, something is going to have to be thrown overboard. And for most of the uniformed military today, Nuclear weapons are at the bottom of their priority list. They've got other things that they're much more interested in, cybersecurity and other things, not all of which all of us like. But they're going to have to cut something. Nuclear weapons, there's no reason why it shouldn't be on the list. So maybe I'm going to stop there and um, have some uh, more time for questions. But uh, write letters to the editor. Uh, write your own member of Congress. But then think a little bit strategically about other organizations in your community that uh, are willing to help you and that may have some influence in your member of Congress. That's it. Thank you so much, Hans and David. Uh, we really appreciate all your insight and knowledge about the B61. Uh, we have a number of questions that have already come in from our attendees, but I just wanted to, to remind everyone if you haven't yet asked a question, please do so by typing in your question in the question panel, uh, and then we'll ask them out loud. Uh, and so our first question is from Coralie Farley. Uh, Coralie asks, um, who and where are the um, upgrades and modifications done, and are there radioactive hazards to those workers uh, modifying the bombs?
let me see here. I can answer uh, some of that. Um, uh, yes. Well, there are several uh, elements of this. Uh, the the weapon itself um, has several components or, or parts to it. Um, the one that contains the radioactive material is the one uh, that involves the nuclear explosive package. Um, work on that uh, happens at um, at the Pantex plant um, in Texas, and uh, it is a uh, uh, a matter of taking the weapon apart to the extent they need to do so. Um, I mean, some of the what are they going to do with each weapon sort of somewhat depends on its individual fingerprint, so to speak, and what's the condition of it. Um, but by and large, that's where that's going to happen. Um, if they're going to to um, recast or reproduce uh, or do some major work on, on one of the two major components in the nuclear war, for example, the secondary that has the highly enriched uranium in it, uh, then that component will be shipped over to um, the Y-12 facility, which is where they specialize in that uh, in, in Tennessee. And um, um, it might also be, but it's less likely that something could end up down in um, uh, down in um, um, in Los Alamos, um, but that's those areas are where they deal with the radioactive components, so to speak, of the weapon. Um, so yes, that's always potentially an issue that um, it, once you're handling that, um, you can you can have accidents and exposures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in the scale of things, though, I would say that it's it's not um, it's not a, a serious hazard in the sense that. Um, uh, you know, we are handling these types of material all the time, but of course it, it doesn't help. Um, and you shouldn't handle this more than you need to, of course. Uh, and this is, comes back to this issue, why are they doing this upgrade of this weapon, and, and do they really have to? And I, as I said in my briefing, I think they could do it with a much cheaper and simpler um, uh, life extension of the B-6117 that would not involve fiddling as much with the warhead uh, as uh, they otherwise would do. Thank you. Um, so just as a follow-up, Hans and David, uh, would you say that the um, exposure to radioactive hazards isn't as compelling an argument against the B-61 as uh, simply the cost and the inefficiency? I think our strongest argument with members of Congress, in particular with Republicans, is the cost. That, that's, what, that's how we're going to win. Absolutely. Totally agree. That's the one that makes this a hot issue right now. Okay. Um, and our next question is from Paul Walker. He asks, uh, why don't we just eliminate the B61 rather than do an expensive LEP now? Well, um, the expensive LEP is the product, the one we have described here over the B6112, um, comes out of, uh, well, guess where, um, a combination of um, uh, the National Nuclear Security Administration and the nuclear laboratories that would like to fiddle with nuclear weapons and, and, and you know, keep people at work and that type of stuff. And then um, uh, military people who are, who, are, who are arguing that there is a need for these, uh, uh, for these capabilities that they're going to add to this weapon. Um, so uh, you, as I said, you could do a cheaper one that is much cheaper that um, it just extends an existing version. Um, now the military wants uh, to have at least one gravity weapon, um, uh, one bomb for its bombers or for its aircraft in some shape or form. Um, whether whatever shape or form it's going to take uh, is another matter, so to speak. Uh, the main thing is for them that they have at least one gravity bomb. So it doesn't have to be the B-6112. It could be the B-6217 that I described. Um, so that's just to say that you know there are different constituencies who push for this. Um, uh, and so that, that would be my response. All right. Um, our next question is from John Burroughs. Uh, John asks, uh, what role will the Senate Armed Services Committee have on the B-61 this year and next year? Well, the Armed Services Committees in both the House and Senate definitely play a role, but uh, it gets a little complicated. But the center of uh, political gravity has really shifted over to the Appropriations Committees. 
for a couple of reasons. One is the armed services committees are all the committees are supposed to get their work done by October 1. That's the beginning of the budget year every year. And so in theory, you get all this work done by the end of September. Well, the armed services committees are chronically late and don't finish their bill until like a week before Christmas in December. And by that time, the budget, the new budget's already gone into effect. So their budget numbers have been overtaken by what the appropriators have already put together. The other thing is the the armed services committees are not bound by uh, the budget caps, which is crazy, but that's the way it is. And so they end up writing bills that are way over the budget caps, and so their uh, dollar amounts get um, ignored. And the real decision makers the last couple of years, and I think it will be this year, is the House and Senate Appropriations Committee. They get to, They have to get a bill done by October 1, or literally the federal government turns off the lights and second, they have to live under these uh, budget caps. So the power of uh, the purse really has shifted from the armed services committees over, more over to the appropriations. But having said that, all of the committees are, are definitely involved. If a member is on the armed services committee, uh, they, will, they can have an influence over the final decision if they want to. So if you've got a member of Congress that's on one of these uh, is on the Armed Services Committee, by all means, you should be contacting them. OK. Our next question is from Edie Allen. And Edie asks, who wants to be 61? Well, I'll start, and then Hans may have a different uh, viewpoint. I think uh, what I see is just a lot of inertia. I mean. Just like the laws of physics, uh, things that are at rest tend to stay at rest, and things in motion tend to stay in motion. Those same laws apply to politics. So these these life extension programs have been um, considered for a long time, and a lot of it, in my opinion, is just inertia. Second, I would call it the what I call the civilian ideologues, primarily at the Defense Department, that just think uh, the United States needs to continue to be a uh, superpower. Real superpowers have nuclear weapons. We need to maintain nuclear weapons in Europe. This B-61 is the last uh, US nuclear weapon in Europe. So it's obvious to them that we need to continue this. The last uh, constituency um, is, uh, frankly, economic interest in New Mexico. Uh, that's where a lot of this money is going to be spent. So you've got the Sandia National Laboratory and the members of Congress out there. Uh, most of the $12 billion would be spent there. That's a lot of money for New Mexico. And so they, they're they definitely interested in uh, that money coming out there. And you also have just very conservative uh, think tanks here in Washington. Anything that's nuclear to them uh, is a good idea. So it's a combination of uh, what I would call ideologues plus uh, uh, parochial interest in jobs. The one group that really broadly is not supporting it. I mean, there's parts of it that are, is the uniform military. I mean, the budget pressures are just enormous. And they have other things that they want the money for. Hans? Uh, yeah, those groups are definitely, uh, <clears throat> all of them, in the play from their various backgrounds. And uh, I would add one more, which is um, in NATO, of course, where um, we have had a group of um, constituencies various countries, and they're not necessarily the same. They vary from country to country. But by and large, there are people in the defense uh, establishments, but, but also reaching into the foreign affairs uh, sectors, where you've had um, uh, sort of the new development of NATO, where it's expanding eastward. You have old former uh, Warsaw Pact members coming in, uh, a very different culture uh, in, in their ministries and background, who are very suspicious about Russia. Uh, who got a lot of visits by uh, lobbyists from the United States, people who would like to see nuclear weapons stay in Europe, and et cetera. And they were briefed extensively by them and, um, you know, sort of catered, <laughs> if you will, um, with simple ideas and, and needs for, for nuclear weapons in Europe. And so all of that feeds back in to this big pot 
of uh, constituencies that all have their interest, uh, whatever it might be, regardless of the arguments, really, uh, mm -hmm. just to uh, retain these capabilities. And so, you know, that, that makes it hard to take apart. It makes it hard to, to attack. Um, but on the other hand, um, they've been quite vocal over the last four or five years, and uh, we have met many of them. <laughs> Um, both traveling in Europe uh, and and also around uh, the United States and meeting with the various uh, groups that, that uh, David mentioned before. But also, if you just listen to what Hans and I said, you could get pretty discouraged and say, oh my gosh, I'm not going to work on this. I'm going to spend the summer gardening instead. We have a very good chance of winning, in my opinion. We just told you all the groups that are on the wrong side we have a lot of groups on the right side, and we just have these enormous budget pressures that I think are going to propel us to winning on this um, issue. So, yes, there's lots of people out there that want to get this thing done, but I'm cautiously optimistic we're going to win. All right. Um, our next question is from Alicia Dressman. Uh, she asks, do you anticipate inaccuracies and cost projections with the W7888 LEP, which happens with the B61 LEP? Um, sorry, I couldn't hear it. Uh, the, you're talking about cost adjustments? Um, she's asking if you anticipate in, uh, inaccuracies in cost projections um, with the W78 and 88 LEP, which happens with the B61 LEP. Oh, absolutely. I mean, this seems to be the rule of the day. You know, everybody makes one cost estimate, and uh, the next year or two years later, it's out the window, and in comes a bigger one. I mean, this is – the National Nuclear Security Administration is notorious for um, issuing unrealistic and, and underestimated uh, initial budget estimates for, uh, for the programs, and once it gets the approval for it, you know, up goes the cost. I mean, this is not just weapons. This is also infrastructure facilities. Uh, it is an enormous scandal, and uh, you know, it's just draining the budget. And so that's that's just unbelievable to see that happening again and again and again. And how members of Congress, they know it's coming, and they know the first estimate that's coming is always unrealistic. Uh, but uh, that's the circus. All right. Um, our next question is from Mary Leah Kelly, and she asks, uh, in meetings with Congress in April 2013, it was said that the NNSA will come out with its new cost, cost, cost estimate excuse me, this summer. What have you heard about this? Um, anything about the timing or the substance or any updates? Well, let me uh, start. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Or go ahead, Hans. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. They keep telling Congress that they're um, about to send up uh, comprehensive uh, budget estimates for all their programs, but this thing keeps getting pushed back, and merely, as you know, we're about to go to our uh, third administrator in about four months at NSA. So I'm assuming that at some point this summer uh, they'll be forced to, otherwise they're going to get their budget cut. Uh, but I don't have a specific date. Um, as to when, when these documents are going to come up. They're very late on them, and they keep telling Congress that they're on their way, but um, my guess is July. Yeah, I, I would say early summer, uh, mid-summer, that's for sure. Um, whether it's a comp or how comprehensive it is remains to be seen, but obviously they will have to have some formal working budgets to, to go along with. But um, but sort of early, mid-summer, that's been my the vibes I've heard, too. All right, um, I think we have time for just one more question. Um, and our last question will come from Eileen Fleming. She asks, how can Americans effectively unite to pressure the government to pursue a nuclear-free world and clean up the chemical and radioactive contamination that pollutes our world? Well, that's a good question, but it's a long answer and we probably take us another hour. But uh, to me, you got to start with your local members of Congress, and you got to put together uh, some kind of informal constituency uh, that is willing to press your members of Congress. 
if your member of Congress uh, is, not, is completely hopeless, then you got to think about is there is it possible to replace that uh, member of Congress. I mean, that's how you get political power in this country, is uh, you put together an effective organization uh, at the local level uh, with uh, agreed upon uh, points and press your uh, case with member of Congress. Show that member of Congress that you've got power at the ballot box. If you can't uh, move that person, then you look for getting somebody to run against that person and get a new member of Congress. But it really is political power. And I would also say that just super important to participate uh, and, and, and color, try to color the debate on this, because if you don't do it, um, well, those who argue for these systems will certainly do it. <laughs> and so it's not, it's not a controversial thing or it's not a, you know, a forbidden thing to talk about deep cuts of nuclear weapons today and, and even the ultimate goal of elimination. Uh, remind people that it is, in fact, even uh, an integral part of the nuclear post review that the Pentagon has put out today. It didn't used to be in that just a few years ago, but uh, right. now is. So this is actually, it's not just sort of, you know, people can say you're not patriotic or something like that. This is part of the plan. And so that's U.S. nuclear policy. So I use that to the advantage and, and color the debate. In my opinion, uh, the majority of the American public agree with us. The problem is, if you ask John Doe out in Peoria, Illinois, what's the most important issue you, uh, for Congress to work on, you'd have to ask that question 20 or 30 times before they get to nuclear weapons. Our support is a mile wide and an inch deep. So the trick is to try to mobilize people to push their member of Congress. Well, Hans and David, thank you both so very much for your time, um, for your great presentation. This is really helpful and very informative. Um, and thank you to everyone on the line who attended. Uh, we appreciate you spending this hour with us to learn about such an important subject. Uh, we just wanted to give you a heads up. Um, this webinar is the first in a new series that we're doing on nuclear weapons programs. Our next webinar will take place on June 24th at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, it's going to be discussing the mixed oxide MOX plutonium program. Um, and Catherine Fuchs of Alliance for Nuclear Accountability and Tom Clements of Nuclear Watch South will be presenting. Um, so be on the lookout for an invitation to register for that webinar. Um, we do ask that you fill out our follow-up survey uh, before you sign off. We appreciate your feedback as we present these webinars. Um, and again, thank you so much for being with us, and we will wrap up. Thank you again, Hans and David. Thanks, thank you.